Man of wisdom. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have laughed. Yeah. Young Donovan down the back there told his mother recently that his granddad was a wise old man. Last night I had a few words to him about that one word, old. <laughs> and he has agreed that I'm not old, I'm just wise. Yeah. And if I've got any wisdom at all, I think I should open in prayer and get on with it, or he might think otherwise at the end. I want to have a message of encouragement this morning. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a loving God. We thank you that we've sung of your great faithfulness and we experience it day by day. But may we know it more and more in a very real way as we listen to your word this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be a bit unorthodox today and I'm actually going to attempt to sing a hymn as part of the message. Unfortunately, every single one of our singers, apart from our faithful elder here, Ron, has decided to go away. So that could leave me behind the microphone singing again, and some of you will probably remember what happened last time. So we'll see what happens. But I want the words. The words of this hymn, it is well, it is well with my soul to permeate our beings. And that hymn writer can say things that I couldn't hope to say. His title this morning is The Unchanging Faithfulness of God. It comes from a message I gave many, many years ago, and this is a much, much less in-depth one than normal. And if we go to that first section, please, Linda. God's unchanging nature and character. And I just want to go through this very quickly, and I'm using the Jay and Darby translation simply because of the, he brings out stronger the word about God being the same. I am he, I am the same. It is a divine title, the ever-existing one, the self-existing one who never changes. Malachi 3.6, if you want to read that passage of scripture, it's absolutely wonderful. For I, Jehovah, change not. And I'm just establishing this unchanging character of God here. Hebrews 13, 8 to 9. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and to the ages to come. 2 Kings, 9, 2 Kings 19, 15. Thou are the same. Thou alone art the God of all the kingdoms of the earth. Deuteronomy 32, 39, See now that I, I am he. This time Jay and Darby is the he, the more familiar, or the same. And there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, and there is none that delivereth out of my hand. Psalm 102, 23 to 28, but verse 27, But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, which is quoting Psalm 102. And thou in the beginning, Lord, has found of the earth, and the works of thy hands are the heavens. They shall perish, but thou continuest still. And they shall all grow old as a garment, and as a covering shall roll them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Now the Hebrew translation between I am he and I am the same, I'll leave that for the scholar because I am not a Hebrew scholar. But does God ever change? Genesis 6 says, 6 says, And God repented that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. Repentance is a change of mind. So it's one of these contradictions that people like to grab on to try and destroy the meaning of the Bible. What little Hebrew I do know is the Hebrew word can for repent in the Old Testament. It does mean to repent as in a change of mind, but it also means to be eased and comforted in one's mind. And God was not eased and comforted in the mankind that he created because they were exceedingly wicked. It was just before the flood. But did they have to be destroyed like that? No. Noah was a preacher of righteousness and they could have repented and they would not come, have come under God's judgment. God is essentially the same in his love and character. He is essentially the same and always will be in his righteousness and holiness. And yet he is always willing to forgive those who come in repentance to him. 
And so in that sense, in that sense only, God ever changed. He is always willing. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all may come to repentance. Now the main passage of scripture I want to look at comes as a message of encouragement from the book of Lamentations, which might sound like a contradiction. If you're looking forward to go to Isaiah and Jeremiah and then Lamentations. But firstly, Jeremiah, just to set the scene, the word of the Lord came to Abraham last week, wasn't it, John? Well, this time it came to Jeremiah. And it said to him, and I hope the Palaszczuk government is somehow listening this morning, it said to him in verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. This horrendous abortion bill is going to be tried to be passed through Parliament. Here is God sanctifying a perfect man, a babe, an unformed babe, in the womb of the mother for a purpose that he was going to fulfil through him. Then Jeremiah said, Oh, well, God, I can't speak. I'm only a youth. He was possibly about 20 years old. God said, don't say, I'm you just a youth, for you shall go out to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Jump forward, just a passage later in Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Oh, if only we could all be like that, that the Word of God was so effervescently bubbling up from within us and spreading out the message of God's love to those around us. Although, of course, Jeremiah's message was not so much about love, but rather the impending judgment of Israel. They were about to be sent to Babylon, most of them were in captivity of only a few remaining in the city of Jerusalem, absolutely destroyed. No food, no water, no nothing. In fact, if you're a mother of a young child, some sections of Lamentations will give you terrible, terrible nightmares. It was the worst, probably the worst time in the history of Israel. And Jeremiah is going through this roller coaster of emotions. You see it like the Psalms. One minute he's pouring out warnings of dire judgment, and the next minute he's bursting forth in praise to the Lord. I don't know about you, I read the biography of a great Christian man once, and I, once and I just couldn't identify with him. He was just too holy, too saintly. He never got upset about anything in life, and he went through a lot of things that I'm not knocking him. But either he must have reached sinless perfection, which I certainly haven't, or the biographer was writing it through rose tinted glasses. Sometimes life is like that, where we go through these emotional things, things that go wrong in our life, it might be our health, we've all got to the stage if I think everyone here has probably seen a doctor. Sometimes family can let us down, sometimes our Christian family can let us down, and great hurt can come into our lives. We all know about it, I don't need to tell you anything about that. But Jericho, by the time we get to Lamentations, he's in Jerusalem with the remnant that stayed there. And still they disobeyed the word of the Lord and went down to Egypt where probably Jeremiah died. Doesn't sound very encouraging. Doesn't sound like a great success story. But let's read a few verses. Lamentations, it's chapter 3. And I'll start reading from 17, it won't be up there yet, just so you get the scene. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity, and I said my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and groaning, the worm of it warned and the gall. My soul still remembers and sinks within me. Then you get a change of tone. This I recall unto my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, though in you every morning, great is your faithfulness. We sang that amazing hymn this morning and how true it is. But do we need to wait until we're in the situation of Jeremiah 
Here are these loving kindnesses. Here are these compassions. Here are these tender mercies that are new every day. God is reaching out to each one of us to know him with a fresh supply every day. And all we need to do is reach out and to partake of his blessing day by day. I was reading in Malachi where God said he wanted to open the heavens and pour out so much blessing that all the world wouldn't be able to hold it. And again, it was in similar circumstances to what we read here. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who will wait patiently for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope. And hope doesn't mean the vague hope of the world, but that certainty. And wait quietly for the salvation of the world. When you're in the midst of some dark days as you go through some things in life, and you, as it were, you're in the pit, in the very bottom and the deepest part of it, wait quietly for the salvation or for the help of the Lord out of that situation. And as we go on, it says in verse 31, For the Lord will not cast off forever, though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies, for he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. And there is a great theological debate there about whether God calls us evil. We're not going to go into it this morning. It's translated disasters and calamities, and he's brought these things on Israel time and time again. He is the very enemies to discipline them because he loved them. And love is behind it, and always will be. God is a holy and righteous God, and he must punish sin. And he was doing this in Jeremiah's day. All I had to do is repent of that sin and turn to the Lord, and he would have blessed them and blessed them abundantly. We go on Lamentations 3. Verse 37, who is he who speaks and it comes to pass when the Lord has not commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that woe and well-being proceed? Why should a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? And there's the key. Why should a man complain? We are the ones who have sinned. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet, praise God, we can put that right with God. It only takes a few seconds, a few minutes to get right with God. And His forgiveness is always there and always available. Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. There's another word there you could almost say, let us repent. Turn away from evil, turn away from sin and turn back to the Lord. Let us Lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. So you see the roller coaster of emotions as he goes through here. But I want you to remember one thing in particular <coughs> that his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Reach out and receive the blessing that God wants to give you day by day. And one final verse, which is in chapter 55. I called on your name, O Lord, from the lowest pit, the lowest part of his experience, in the depths of despair. You have heard my voice. You did not hide your ear from my sighing, from my cry for help. You drew near on the day I called on you and said, Do not fear. And I can remember very, very vividly reading this one verse. I was in the army, WH, the old building, it wasn't air conditioned, it was boiling hot, you grab potatoes on the dirt on the windowsills, the nurses were on strike, I was desperately trying to get painkillers and I wouldn't come, no, I'm going to go slow strike. Very seldom I criticise the nurse, they're wonderful people. And I happened to read that through lamentation, I just came on this verse, you drew near on the day that I called on you and said, do not fear. His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. <coughs> Great is his faithfulness. And of course, in the New Testament, we're not immune. God chastens those whom he loves. It doesn't seem good at the time, the writer says, but afterwards, 
yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness. And we each one of us need to experience that. We need to know, is God chastening me as I go through this experience? It's not necessarily so that evil and sin came into the world through Satan. And Satan is going about trying to be like a roaring lion, seeking him be made of our scripture says. But he cannot devour the believer in Jesus Christ. Resist the devil and he will flee. Draw an air to God and he will draw an air to you. Easy to say, but the key is in the previous line, be in submission to God. The New Testament is in Romans 8. And I just want us a similar example. Here there is no question of sin and judgment. I'm sure individually there was. But here is the early church going out, spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet they are being persecuted for it. And I love the words that Paul uses here. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sore? As it is written in Psalm 44, verse 22. For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You can put the things in your life that you've been through, that you are currently going through, or that you might face in the time soon to come, and you can put them into that list. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or sword. There was no social security. If you had a bad back like me, you're totally dependent on your family for just basic food. Put your own thoughts into it of what you are going through yourself. And then it goes on. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. And that's what I entitled this one. More than conquerors. I'm not going to stand here today and say that I always feel like I'm more than conquering. Sometimes I feel a bit dashed around and bruised and down. But I am more than a conqueror. Why? Through him who has loved us. Past tense, but in the Greek it's in the aorist tense, I think. John, you'll find that something that was accomplished in the past continues right here and now and forever will. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I love that. I can go over that over and over again. Nothing can separate me. Nothing can separate you. No matter what experience you go through from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. A few verses earlier in Romans 8, 80, 18 to 19, speaking about suffering again. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. There the writer is looking past the return of Christ for his church to the revealing of Christ with his church as he comes to fully establish his kingdom and rule in absolute righteousness where there will be no harm or any will defile in all God's holy mountain. The sufferings of this present time. Even though they're very real and even though they get us down at times, let us keep looking unto Jesus. Let us be assured that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That basically is my message, but I'd like to sing this hymn. Joan, if you could come up and run, would you be able to go behind that microphone? Yeah, it's not on. It's not on? Don't mind me turning off then, please. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me sing one. Three and five. One, three and five. But you know what happened last time I tried to sing. We've got Joan to play this time. But try and apply these words to where you've been in your life, where you are right now, and where you might be soon. And then I just want to read something about the writer of this hymn. Thanks, Joan.
the water for the men, but Lord, tis the leave for thy coming we wait.